Sure, just just real simple. Uh, sometimes you got to travel a lot of lengths to get on this podium to talk to you guys. You guys have been asking to talk to me for years. Uh, here I am. Here's your opportunity. Um, fire away. Okay, Brent, down front. Yeah, I remember one time I said, see you next week, and you said, no, I'll see you next, next year. Next year, I do remember yeah. that. So Brent Swarneman, Houston yeah. Chronicle. We've seen what you can do on defense here. What are your plans for the offense? Yeah, I mean, obviously, everybody, that's the million-dollar question. And, and, and what I tell people this, uh, we are going to find a way to play explosive offense. Uh, we're going to be uh, part of the modern era. Uh, we're going to be able to switch up tempos. We're going to be able to utilize our personnel. Uh, I think in this day and age, you've got to be able to be very multiple and very adaptable uh, in what you do on offense. I think people get caught up uh, in these words like they mean everything, like, oh, we got to be spread or we got to be pro style. And at the end of the day, we've got to be a group that knows how to attack defenses, get the ball in our playmakers' hands, and allow them to be successful. Front left, Olin. Yeah, Olin Buchanan, Tech Sags. Uh, Coach, is there anything that you, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, learned in the last two years about being a head coach that maybe you didn't know before? Oh, gosh. Uh, how much time do you have? No, uh, listen, I think the opportunity to get out and lead an organization is, is critical. And, and um, you know, I'll forever be thankful to the people at Duke for giving me that opportunity, to President Price, to, to AD Nina King, and um, that entire group of players. And, and um, you know, listen, I'm here now. And so uh, sometimes those words sound a little bit off, but it mean that. And uh, I think you learn how to lead men uh, in every aspect of the program. Uh, I think you learn how to lead coaches. Uh, I think you learn how to to develop and implement an off-season program uh, and how that kind of can equip your team to do great things during the season. Uh, the organization that goes into managing the amount of people that are in a modern day football operation, uh, you know, and then still making sure that you're doing the things you need to do from an X and O standpoint to make sure that the football product looks the way you want it to look. And so I think learning how to manage all of that, um, you know, every year you do it, you should get better at it if you're self-evaluating yourself the right way. Second row on the right, Christy. Christy Regan from the Associated Press. You said earlier to the fans that um, you're tired of talking about winning a national championship. It's time to be about it. But just to talk about it a little bit more, <laughs> um, what, what gives you confidence that you'll be able to bring the Aggies their first national championship since the 1930s? Yeah, I, I just think when you look at what this program is capable of, what we've got to do is we've got to fulfill that potential. And I think that happens with work. And, and I think that was the message I sent to the players. That was the message I tried to deliver to the crowd. Um, we can't just say we want to be something. We can't just say we want to arrive somewhere. We've got to be committed to all the work that it's going to take from today until we kick off next September of doing that. And, and there's a lot that goes into that. There's culture building. There's camaraderie. Pottery, there's connecting with the players. There's the players connecting at a greater level with each other. Uh, there's strength and conditioning. There's development. You know, there's so much that goes into winning football games in the fall, and um, those are the things that we've got to start taking pride in. You know, it's it's easy to take pride in making big plays on Saturday in front of 110,000 people. Uh, are we willing to do the things that we need to do when no one's looking, so that we can have the results that we want come the fall? Front row left, David. David Nuno, Texax, with so much to do over the next couple of weeks, how do you prioritize that? And what is what are your next week or two look like? What, what, what's the order? Yeah, I mean, it's an absolute whirlwind. And, and I don't know that you prioritize. I think you just have to compartmentalize because there's so many things uh, that have to get accomplished. So the, the first thing is connecting with these players, uh, getting one-on-one -on -one meetings set up with them, getting an opportunity to sit down with them, uh, learn their story, learn who they are as young men, um, figure out the ways that we can kind of enhance uh, the experience that they're having here at Texas A&M. Uh, there's a recruiting class uh, that is going to sign really quick here uh, and trying to get on the phone with those guys and the families and the decision makers with all of those kids and making sure that we lock them into what we're doing and can convince them of the vision that we have here at Texas A&M. Uh, hiring a staff, right, which is going to be a huge piece of this thing too and trying to sort through that process and, and not rushing it. Uh, but making sure we efficiently and effectively get people in here that fit our vision and what we want to try to do uh, and build. And, and I think that becomes the priority between now and, and the first signing day, which is coming right around the corner. Second row on the right, Tyler. Yeah, Tyler Shaw with KBTX-TV. Coach, um, at what point were you approached about th this opening? And 
Um, how easy of a, of a decision was this? Um, you know, I'll let you talk to, to Ross about all the logistics of the process. Uh, how easy? Uh, I think every decision is really easy and really hard. I think uh, if you're true to yourself, you know, professionally chasing this opportunity, coming to this great program, this great institution, you know, that's easy. Uh, when you think about leaving relationships, leaving people, uh, the strain and stress it puts on your family, that's really hard, right? And, and so as a coach, you're always kind of caught in this back and forth pull. And, and I'm very thankful that I've got a very supportive family that kind of backs me and, and backs my career and the things that we want to do to kind of chase my dreams to some degree. And, and that's ultimately what gets us here. Front row left, Cease. Robert Sesson the Bryan College Station Eagle. Mike, you touched on offense, but do you still believe that defense wins championships when it comes right down to it? Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably a combination. I, I think if you look around it at what has won national championships recently, uh, I think there's a couple of things that stand out. I think one, there's a toughness that's built within the program that obviously has to do with defense. I think every one of those teams at some point in the season uh, has had to dig deep on defense and find a way to win uh, a really important game. But I think all of those teams have also been explosive on offense with really talented quarterback play. And I think uh, every single one of those teams has won a game you know, 38-35, 41-38. I just think uh, some of these teams in this conference have so much offensive firepower that there's going to be games you're going to get into and you're going to have to be able to match it. And so I don't know that you could ever say we're going to be one or the other. Uh, I do think there's a blue-collar toughness that comes from having a great defense that stands the test of time. Um, but if you can't score points, you won't win games enough to be where we want to be. Front row right, Travis. I got Travis Brown, the Bryan College Station Eagle. Uh, when you left this place, did, did you sense that this was a place you could return to one day? And what made Bryan College Station such, such a special place for your family? Yeah, I mean, obviously, listen, playing in Kyle Field is one of the un most unique atmospheres in the country. And, and when that place gets rocking, uh, there's nothing like it. And, and what makes it even more unique is it's rocking every single Saturday. Uh, you saw that this year, right? Regardless of record, regardless of how things are going, um, you know, the 12th man shows up and they show up and they support. And so when you have that, that makes it really special. And then, um, you know, I got a chance to talk a lot about it, but the community here is, is really unique. And the way they welcomed my family in the last time we were here, uh, my wife, my kids, they all have a lot of connections in this community that we've stayed close with, uh, even in the two years that we were away. And so, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it feels like you're coming home. It really does. And do you have a timetable for when you want to set up your staff? And is Elijah going to be a part of that? Um, Elijah will certainly be a priority. And, and getting him to stay here uh, is a huge priority. That, that process has already begun. Um, obviously, him and I have a, a strong relationship from the last time we were here. And um, you're certainly going to do everything in our power to make sure that this is the place he believes is the right fit for him uh, in his future moving forward. Uh, in terms of the rest of it, you know, I don't think you ever want to put a timetable on it. I think you want to you do it as quickly quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, but we have to get it right. Um, we have to get the right people in this program to lead these young men. Um, and that's from a coordinator perspective, that's from a position coach perspective, that's from a recruiting office perspective. Um, we have to build this staff um, to match what we're capable of being. And, and as long as it takes to get that right is as long as it will take. Second row on the left, Sam. Hi, Sam Conn from The Athletic. Welcome yeah. back. Um, curious, what does a championship football player look like for you when it's recruiting like what's the profile of a guy that you're looking for yeah you know I don't know that there's necessarily a profile I think there are some intangibles that go into it you got to find kids who love football uh, you got to find kids who, who love the hard parts of the game of football I think that's a huge piece of it nowadays is, is who is willing to really put in the work to become great you know and, and we've got to find kids that are capable of being first round draft picks that three years later are first round draft picks, right? And, and that's the unique part of recruiting in this modern era. And, and so, um, you know, as much as talent plays an enormous role and we're gonna go out and identify the most talented players at their position across the country, um, I also think there's a level of intangibles that goes into uh, what allows those great talented players to become extremely successful in the college level. Front row on right here, Cole. Cole Thompson, AllAggies.com. Coach, you talk about having a blue-collar mentality with the modern field, but what are some other philosophies or necessities that need to be established to create a 
championship winning culture in College Station? Yeah, I think the, the first thing is just an accountability to this program, uh, I think. And I talked to the kids about this earlier in the first team meeting. Um, you know, we have to be about Texas A&M. Uh, we can't be about, uh, you know, what I want to do to get a higher draft status. We can't be about what I want to do to get a better NIL deal. Um, we have to be about what I can do to make Texas A&M great. And through that come all of those opportunities. And if you look around at the programs that are doing it at a really high level right now, that's what's happening. You know, they're doing the things they need to do to perform on the field as individuals and as a team. And it's leading to all of the things they want, high draft picks, NIL, all of the things that, that are really important to these young men. And so um, it's just making sure the priorities are in the right place, um, that they're, they're chasing the things that are ultimately going to lead to where they want to go. Or girl on the left, Shahan. Hey, Shahan J. Rogers, CBS Sports. How you doing, Coach? Um, sure. You know, so obviously, 34 and 13 during your time at Texas A&M last time. Last two years have been a little bit rougher. Uh, when you come back to this job and evaluate, one, what do you think it kind of takes to get back to where you guys are? And what do you think that you kind of need to do to get to that next point? Yeah, I, I just think it's it's kind of just replugging the kids in. And I think, you know, when you look at what Elijah has done the last two weeks, I think you've already started to see that process started. You know, it's um, it's really hard when you have high expectations and, and you come up short, right? As, as hard as that is for the fans and as hard as it is for the people who support the program, uh, it's even harder for the kids who put in all of the work and the coaches who put in all of the work. And so um, some of it is just kind of recharging it, you know, kind of providing a fresh perspective some prof uh, some fresh leadership direction, um, giving them something to kind of rekindle that fire and get them something to believe in moving forward, uh, you know, and then just kind of holding them to that uh, every step along the way. Front row right, Mark. Uh, Mark Passwaters, Rivals. Um, how do you plan to go about juggling the difficulties of the transfer portal next week and then early signing when you're basically flying solo as you tr also try to assemble a staff? <laughs> Uh, if you got any suggestions, I'll take them. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, listen, you, we're going to have to try to get some people in here. Uh, we're going to have to count on the professionalism of some of the people that are in the building. Uh, and, and I'll certainly talk to some of those guys about that. Um, we're going to have to count on, on what Texas A&M represents. Um, and, and again, we're going to have to try to uh, move 100 miles an hour at a very precise direction, right? And sometimes that's really hard to do. Um, but we got to make sure we spend an awful lot of time here in the next three days trying to identify that. Uh, so when we do hit the road running on Friday, um, we're going in the direction we need to be going. Our girl on the left, Alex. Hey, Mike. Alex Miller with yeah. the Eagle. You know, the, only being gone two years, you probably had – relationships with some of these guys you either coached or recruited uh you know what was kind of your message to them and their response and could, did you maybe get to speak a little differently having those prior relationships instead of coming into a room maybe a little cold yeah you know it was it was probably a unique start to a first team meeting you know there's not many times when you go into a first team meeting and and 50 of the players come up and give you a big hug and welcome you back right and and so i think the start was really unique. It was great to see a lot of those kids, uh, some of those kids that I have coached, uh, some of those kids that I kind of watched on the other side of the ball, some of those kids that were part of the evaluation process and the recruiting process but didn't actually get to see uh, arrive on campus. And so um, that part was really good. But then I think when you get up in front of them, um, all of that has to go away, right? Because it's about new leadership. It's about new direction. It's about establishing a new identity. And, and so you just start building the roadblocks for what that looks like. And so so uh, as much as there is this continuity of guys that you've known and, and you uh, have related to over the years, you know, there's still a job that needs to be done and building it to the level that needs to get to. And you got to make sure you don't cut any corners in doing that. Fourth row on the left, Carter. Hey, Mike. Carter Carls, 247 Sports. Uh, you mentioned uh, Texas high school coaches and just how important they are to you. Just what, what was your relationship with them like when you were here and – how do you think you'll be able to hit the ground running with those guys? Yeah, I think it's a it's a multifaceted question, right? It's it's recruiting has become so fast paced and so global, you can't lose sight of of where you are, right? And and we're in the state of Texas, and the state of Texas is the elite football state for high school football in the country, right? And so we've got to make sure that we're we're taking our time and going in and seeing the coaches, spending time with the coaches. Uh, I was able to do that some, probably not as much as I maybe would have liked, but certainly able to do that some. And I think that's got to be a priority. And then I think 
think it's it's access. I think one of the biggest things as a great football playing university in this state is is we have to provide access. We got to be welcoming to the high school coaches. We've got to get them around our building. We've got to get them to see how we are running this thing so that they can go back uh, and breathe confidence about what's happening here at Texas A&M. Uh, and, and I think that's a big part of it. And, and you know, as a head coach at Texas A&M, you know, part of this is a responsibility to help build young coaches in this state. Uh, and a lot of that is the young high school coaches in this state. And um, to be able to take time amidst everything that's in this crazy world of college athletics, uh, I still think that is extremely important. We'll stay on the left side, fourth row. Howdy, Coach. Howdy. Rob Havens with the Aggie Land Illustrated. Um, I got to go back and watch your introductory press conference at Duke a, a couple of years ago this morning. And you talked about how each one of your stops, uh, each school was like a puzzle. And you kind of had to figure out what pieces. So having seen this puzzle before, what, what pieces do you think are going to be important for us to win a championship? Yeah, I think um, I think every program is unique, right? And every situation is unique. And, and we play in, in the best football conference in the country. I don't think that's debatable. Um, and so our recipe for success has got to be uh, an ability to, to achieve under pressure, ability to hit those critical moments and make the right plays when the game is on the line, understanding situational football, because a lot of games are going to come down to the fourth quarter. Uh, I think those are some of the tactical elements that maybe make this conference a little bit different and then you just look at um, you know how large of a profile this program is uh, and making sure you're doing a lot of good lot of time educating young men on on everything that goes along with that, right? The pressures of being a Texas A&M fighting Aggie, right? The social media and how that all plays a role and how these kids are able to perform. I think there's different challenges that exist at, at each job. And I think identifying what they are, identifying how you can tackle them and equip our players to become the best they can become, um, I think that's just really important no matter where you are. Coach, we'll go back behind the lights, the right side, Ben. Yeah. Hey, Coach, Ben Peck, KXTV. Uh, Kind of going off of Chrissy's question from earlier when you were talking about, you know, it's it's time to stop talking about things. It's time to start doing some stuff. What what do you, in your opinion, what are some of the things that have been maybe talked about but haven't been delivered upon? The, and and what are your plans for those areas to kind of take things over the top? Yeah, I just I think it's it's a natural reaction to want to accelerate the process of success, right? And so. Um, you know, everybody wants to be a national championship program, right? And and we certainly have everything that we need to be that. But uh, a lot of that stuff is when you guys aren't looking. You know, a lot of that stuff is when we're in this building by ourselves, when we're in the indoor in February, when we're in the weight room in January. Um, that's when you're building a lot of those things that ultimately kind of lead to what you guys see next fall. And I just think we have to embrace that part of, of football and, and that part of football is not fun. Uh, it's not on social media. There's no fanfare with it. Nobody watches it and says, wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, a lot of times it just sucks and that's the reality of it. But if you want to be good in the fall and you want to be competing for this thing at a really high level, there's a price you have to pay to get there. And, and I think that's kind of what I mean when I say we've got to be about it. We've got to be about all those things within the game of football that maybe don't get talked about that equip us to go out and make the plays we need to make and be successful in the fall. Coach, we'll stay back behind the lights on the far right side. Coach Parker Ream with uh, KWKT Fox 44. Uh, just kind of wanted to double back on that, you know, obviously a lot of pressure with this job. How do you kind of internalize that and deal with that heading into the season with such high expectations? Yeah, I think, listen, if, if you want to chase the highest prizes in this sport, it's going to come with high expectations and high pressure. You know, there's no program out there that's capable of winning the whole thing that doesn't expect to win the whole thing every year. And so um, I just it's the price you pay. And, and, you know, you embrace who you are. I think I embrace my process as a head coach. I think that's one of the things I told Ross in this process is I believe in who I am. I believe in my process for making decisions. Uh, we won't always make the right one, but when we make the wrong one, we're going to identify it, we're going to evaluate it, we're going to fix it, and we're going to move forward and, um, you know, and not second guess what we're doing and believe in who we are and know that we have what it takes to build a blueprint for the best program in the country. Coach, we're going to wrap you up with the second row on the left, the battalion, then I've got to get Coach to some more obligations, and we'll bring Ross up. Battalion, that's yours. Coach, Luke White with the battalion. What is the message as you get familiar with this team and really get to know the players? Uh, what are y'all talking about? 
Yeah, I, I think the one thing is 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 understanding that relationships is a huge part of it. You know, and as we talk about all of those things that we're going to ask our players to do and all the hard stuff that players have to go through, um, they've got to believe in you. They got to know who you are. They got to know that you know who they are as young men. They got to believe in. Uh, what you're selling and what you're all about, and that ultimately it's going to get them where they want to go. And, and all of that is relationships. And, and if you don't have relationships in this day and age, um, you, you know, you don't. You know, you, you we're way past the days where, uh, you know, a football player comes into a program and the head coach can do whatever he wants and he's stuck and he can't go anywhere. And, you know, this is a relationship era. And, and that part of this is really important. And um, that starts – this week, but it's an ongoing process, really, from the time I start to the time this thing ends, uh, that we've got to continue to build relationships every single day. Coach, thanks for your time. Yeah. We can Thank you, guys. Off this way if you like. See you next year. Yeah. <laughs> See you next week. Rachel will take you, Coach. All right, Ross. There you go. Uh, Texas A&M Director of Athletics, Ross Bjork. We'll let the family move with Coach there, and then we'll get all the cameras set up. All Actually, right. that, was a, that was part of his deal. He only had to do media one time a year. <laughs> you guys okay with that? It's the modern era of college athletics. So, What's that? Yeah, you don't, you don't want me talking about football. So. Coach, uh, yeah. <laughs> Ross, yep. whenever you're ready. Yep. You bet. Questions? Down front, Brent. About this being an incentive-based contract, could you just kind of yeah. discuss what went into the contract? Yeah, I mean, look, that's uh, I think with the uh, CFP expanding to 12 teams, and again, given where we are, given our resources, given the commitment to football, that if we have the right coach and the right plan, that we should be in the hunt every year for those playoff spots. So that's how we looked at it. We know there's got to be a base salary, so that's what you see there. But then the rest of it is built off of making and earning your way through the through the CFP and everybody we engage with you know again this is a little bit different shift right and so not that we are trying to reset the market or you couldn't really necessarily do that but if you hire the right person and they believe in themselves and you have the resources like we have here that that contract should be what it's all about and so that that's how we approached it going into it second row on the left Sam did everybody get a copy of it by the way Everybody got a copy of the financial terms? My CFO doesn't have a copy. Um, we'll get it to you. We'll get, we'll get, get it to Jeff. Jeff. Ross, Sam. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, obviously, a lot of attention, publicity on how things unfolded over yeah. the weekend. What can you tell us about what happened when the process with Mark Stoops and how we got from there to here? Yeah. Well, look, here, here's the thing. Over the last two weeks, when we engage with 30 – up to 30 different coaches at varying levels, right? Some were in person, some were Zoom, some were calls, some were through third parties, et cetera. There's going to be a lot of moving parts. And as President Welsh said, one of the things he learned going through this, it ain't over till it's over. So we wanted to make sure that we engaged with our final group of candidates as long as possible, right? So I don't know how all of that got out. I respect Coach Stoops. He's been in the SEC a long time. I appreciate his, his statement. But here's my job at the end of the day. What is in the best interest? I said this two weeks ago. The best interest of Texas A&M. And the end result is what matters the most. Let's get it right. So the process to me with all the moving parts and all the candidates, to me that validated the choice even more. Is we had a process that was very thorough. We talked to a bunch of people given the fact that we had two weeks and the process was fluid until the very end. But that's why we had to get it right. And I think the process yielded the right result. And that's why we're here today. And you're seeing that as Kel Coach Elko is unfolding his vision for the program. Front right, Cole. Ross, you've talked about having meetings with over 25 coaches. What ultimately was the deciding factor to zero in on Coach Elko yeah. being the guy for long term? You know, it's really those characteristics <clears throat> that I laid out on the stage earlier. Defensive-minded head coach, right? Recruiting elite talent, having that mindset coming from the head coach position. I mean, just look in our league. Who are the two best programs right now? Who are they led by? 
right? And so looking at that formula, understanding that we can recruit at the highest level, understanding that Coach Elko has been a part of top five, top 10 recruiting classes here at A&M. And then honestly, he's got a plan. And you can see by his demeanor, he's been equipped for this for a long time. So I remember calling the, uh, the Duke athletic director two years ago next week. And she wanted to know, is he ready? And I said, he's been ready. This is a no, if, if he's your guy, this is a no-brainer hire. And so the same analysis as we went through our process unfolded here. Third girl on the left, Sean. Sean, J. Rogers, CBS Sports. Uh, Ross, you know, obviously the last coaching contract that you guys handed out, 10-year, 95, completely guaranteed, yeah. no offsets, versus what you obviously present here today. Um, you know, how much of that... I, I guess what went into that and what went into also obviously kind of the just different kind of focus of this search versus ones in the past? Yeah, look, my, my uh, comments have been, let's do a comprehensive national search. That necessarily hasn't been the case, um, at least for the last four. Um, and, and Coach Slocum was promoted internally um, when, when he was hired. And that obviously yielded, when's the last time we had a defensive minded head coach? He's the winningest coach of all time. So, again, that was, that was a cool perspective of this. Look, I just think that having a 12-team playoff, the incentive-based process of a contract, I think the market here in, in the SEC, we wanted to be fair in the market, but we also wanted to say, hey, look, I think the, the landscape can change where you actually have to earn things. And if somebody believes in, in, their, in themselves, believes in their plan, they have the right approach, they'll earn it. And as you can see, you have a chance, right, to be paid like a national championship level coach. And so th that was the approach through the process, and those are all the conversations that, that took place. Second row on the right, Tyler. Yeah, Ross, at what point in this process did you uh, approach Mike, and then how long kind of was the, the turnaround yeah. of you presenting the opportunity and, and him agreeing to it? Yeah, we uh, look, we started the process Sunday night on November the 12th, right? And that's people think search firms pick the coach for you. That's not how it works. The search firm, their job is to understand the landscape throughout the whole year, not just during football season, not just when I call them on November 12th and say, hey, OK, are you ready? Well, yeah, they're always ready. So they understand the landscape. They understand who's movable. Coach Elko was on our list from the very beginning. And as the process unfolded, as the identity of what we really, really wanted and we thought was the right DNA of a program that wins, he obviously rose you know, to the top. So there was engagement from the beginning. And like I said, everybody was active. And we kept that process going all the way through uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning. Second and then round. we went and picked him up last night. <laughs> I think you were out there at 2 a.m., right? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't get much sleep like me either. So. Second row on right, Christy. You've talked about a lot of the things that you liked about Elko, but if you had to boil it down to like the best thing about him from your perspective, what would you say? <clears throat> I think a humble but confident genuineness of this game. Look, I, I played college football. I'm not a coach, but I'm a product of it. <clears throat> and if you know his story about you know, his, his parents and how old his mom was when she had him, if you know how he grew up and where he grew up, if you know that he got into an Ivy League school when he maybe wasn't supposed to, if you know that story, to me, that's why he's a great coach and a great leader is because of the beginnings and how he's worked his way through. And so he talked about U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, defensive coordinator, no one's ever heard of it, Division Three, and now he's at Texas A&M. That is a cool, humble, genuine story, and I think that's what the qualities that we were looking for as well, just a great person. Front left, Owen. Yeah, Ross, um, President Wells suggested that there was maybe some uh, misinformation out there about uh, – about this whole process yeah. and everything. So with that in mind, I ask you, uh, was Mike your first choice? And if not, why not? Yeah, look, here, here's the thing. The, these things are fluid. And again, when you get down to crunch time, and I just, I felt 
that if we had the right group of finalists, I think this weekend was critical to get things done, right? Transfer portal opens up. Our transfer portal has been open, right? But we were done playing. The kids had the week off from any football practice. I felt like, look, if we have a final group, then we need to activate that final group and let's zero in on who we think is the number one choice. And, and that's where it led. And really, late Saturday night as everything is, I'm getting pinged as well, right? I don't know if you were part of the, whatever you were tweeting out, Olin. Um, I wasn't reading Twitter, believe me. Um, we were focused on, let's get it right. And that, that's really, again, all that matters, and that's my responsibility, is let's get it right. Front right, Mark. Ross, it looks like the uh, pool for assistance is pretty significant. Was that something that Mike wanted, or was that something that you guys mutually agreed yeah, on? I think, um, I mean, you talk about that through the process, and, and let's make sure we understand what that includes. That includes the pool, I think, is listed at $11 million. Yes, sir. That's actually, it's actually less than what it was. And the thing is, we're going to we're gonna have a plan of what the right staff makeup is, not just hey, we got to add this and we got to add this. It's here's the plan, here's the number that works. So it's all assistant coaches, it's all analysts, it's all recruiting staff, it's all operations staff within football, and it's the strength and conditioning staff. That's what that number is. That's what that number makes up is the comprehensive nature of just the football. But people like athletic trainers, equipment people, uh, video people, they're not in that number. Um, but that number that number's top eight in the country, top 10. So it's a, it's a very competitive number in the landscape. Front left, Cease. Did Mike have a buyout in his contract at Duke? Uh, yeah. what, he, what about that? Who handles that? He does, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that was in that term sheet. I, okay. I don't. Yeah, we, uh, we handle that. Yeah, the institution handles his buyout. You know what? We're still confirming exactly. It depends on dates and everything like that. Yep. Front right, Travis. Yeah, Ross, you mentioned your pool of candidates. How many yeah. were in that finalist pool of candidates? You know what? It's hard to say, honestly. People are still playing games. We went through the weekend. I mean, like I said, we engaged with a bunch of Power Five sitting head coaches, several group of five head coaches, several NFL coaches, right? So it's hard to say exactly what the final group was because things were, were fluid on, on Saturday. And we were still hearing from people wanting to get in, you know, at the last minute. And so you had to filter all of that as well. Do you know how many you were in contact with on Saturday? It was more than five. Let's put it that way. Okay. Either me directly or our firm. And uh, I know you mentioned a little bit less on the, the assistant coaches pool. But was some of that sh uh, shrinkage in the number with uh, some of the buyout of the, for Jimbo? No. Okay. It was being smart about what it takes to run the program. Period. That's all. It, that's all it is. Let's be reasonable, but competitive, and be smart. That's all that is. Fourth row on the left, Rob. Howdy, Ross. Um, Howdy. So with with um, with the other coaches that you had in mind, you didn't necessarily have to get back. But once you chose Mike, did you get a chance to kind of talk to Coach Robinson and and tell him that yeah. a decision had been made? Yeah. No, I, absolutely. That, that's an important part of the process. We I made sure that I personally engage with Elijah throughout the whole process. And, and really, it started the Sunday morning that I asked him to serve as the interim head coach. And my message to him at the time was, I don't know where all this is going to go. We're going to get started. But I will do everything in my power to ensure that he's here as long as he wants to be here. So that process really started two weeks ago. We stayed in touch throughout the process. We stayed in touch throughout the weekend. I met with him last Wednesday and went over kind of where we were in the process. You know, perhaps we can get down to a final group through the weekend, and we'll stay in touch. And so I talked to him a couple times you know, on Saturday after we got back from LSU, talked to him a couple times on Sunday, and just wanted to make sure that you know, he knew, I, not necessarily where we were going, but just, hey, coach, I'm going to keep you posted. We want you to be here. We want to make sure there's stability from your standpoint. And, and like Coach said, that, that's the priority, that Coach Elko will now, he'll handle that, and we'll support him you know, behind the scenes. Ross, we'll go back behind the lights on the right. Ben? Ross, you talked about you know, Coach Elko has a lot of qualities that in some yeah. ways makes him a no-brainer, obviously, his connections here. 
but I also know y'all made a deliberate effort to you know cast a wide net and do your due diligence through all these candidates. How did y'all navigate, I guess, turning the page mentally, just the human instinct of making sure we're vetting out all these people with, let's not overcomplicate this and let's not overthink this. If he's a good fit, let's not hold it against him. Yeah. Let's lean into that. <clears throat> I think it was really, what was really cool is probably the first, I'd say at least the first week of the process. I mean, you're hearing from people that are interested in us too. I mean, we obviously had a list and we want to be proactive in that list, but then it's like, Oh, you heard about this person. You heard about this person. So it actually helped validate what we all say, right? We think we can win championships here. We think we compete at the highest level. Other people saw that. Other people in the football world saw that. So in a lot of ways, then you check that. Okay, how does your final group sort of stack up to what people are saying in the landscape, what we think the DNA should be of the program? And again, that's the goal is to get it right, and everything that Coach Elko has, it matches what we think are the ingredients. So to me, that, that was a great process to learn the incoming, the outgoing, all the conversations. The former players were awesome. Like talking to those guys, I mean, talking to Dat Wynn or Ray Mickens or uh, Johnny Football, he's the one that said, Johnny Manziel's the one that said, we need to be an intimidating bully. He actually had another adjective, but I can't say that. Um, but he said, that's what we got to be. And I'm like, OK, that's, that's pretty powerful coming from an offensive guy. So um, it just matched all the things that you're seeing unfold here in the last you know, couple hours with Coach Elko. Go to the left, Shahan, and then Carter, you'll wrap us up. Hey, Coach. Uh, sorry, not Coach. Uh, hey, Ross. Um, you know, so obviously, you were here when Coach Elko was here. And, you know, you kind of saw as the program slipped mm -hmm. at times after his departure, what do you think he brought to this program before and what do you kind of hope that he brings yeah. now? Well, uh, the, way, the way Coach Fisher operated, um, he let Coach Elko be the head coach of the defense, you know, which gave him, I think, a really good platform from a leadership perspective, how to run that side of the ball. To me, that's invaluable when you take the next step. Um, you're sort of the CEO of the defense, if you will. So I think seeing that, I think, was really critical, seeing how he ran it, seeing the intensity. Um, he was telling a story about um, when they would have team meals, uh, when he was just overseeing the safeties as, as a position, but obviously the defense. They'd go into the team meals on game day, and they would put their phones away. And they would actually have real conversations. And then he'd look around the room, and everybody else was kind of on their phones. And he's like, that's the culture I want to have as a head coach. And obviously, he instilled that at Duke, which led them to, you know, great success the last two years. And that's what he'll he'll do here. Left side, Carter, you'll wrap us up. Yeah, Ross. Uh, just are there any, uh, like, I guess what the plans are for the bowl game as far as who the coaches will be, if Mike will coach at all uh, in the game, probably Elijah. Yeah, Elijah will lead us through the bowl game. As, as the head coach, acting head coach, interim head coach, however you want to describe that. We know there might be some other movement, right, given the landscape and coaching. So, you know, who's coming, who's going, we'll make sure that we have some time to map that out. Coach uh, Robinson and I, and I talked today about, hey, let's get through this week. Let's see what happens. Does anybody else leave? Those things are all fluid. Uh, but obviously, Coach Robinson will be the head coach for the bowl game. Um, the coordinators will call it on offense and defense. And then if there's other movement, then you adapt. And this happens all the time in coaching transitions. You see people kind of coming and going. I don't think Coach Elko wants to be the defensive coordinator for the bowl game. I think he's going to have other things that he's going to have to prep for. Uh, but obviously, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to support our players to compete at the highest level wherever we go, whoever we play. All right, Ross, thanks for okay. your time today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.